So John 15, we are in John 15, verses 1 to 17 this morning. So Jesus is truly a paradox. But like, if God actually became a human being like the Bible tells us, should we really expect anything else than, than a paradox in that individual? I mean, if infinity entered the finite, should we expect anything less than some anomaly? Of course, our finite brains can't comprehend the infinite. I mean, it's fun to think and to try to comprehend. That's how we, we stand in awe and amazement of God. Um, but when he tells us that the infinite entered the finite, it's like you can't comprehend that. So Jesus comes and he says, I am the vine, you're the branches. You can do nothing without me. That he's the source of life, we can do nothing without him. Okay, so when he says that, I can get that. I can wrap my mind around that. He is superior, I am inferior, therefore I need him. There's an equation for you, Shay, that's pretty easy. Superior, inferior, inferior needs superior. I can wrap my mind around that. I can make sense of that. But then he, he says in the next breath, you are my friends. Like, stop the presses here. How does that work? We usually view our friends as our equals. And of course we know Jesus isn't our equal. He's infinitely superior to us. He, he came to, to, to bear our sins. He is the vine. He is the source of everything we need. And then he says, and I'm your friend. It's like, wait a minute. How's that work? Because God is love, and in that, in Christ rather, we see we have a perfect balance. He lays down his life for his friends, which is perfect love. And he commands us to love each other, as we talked about last week, as he loved us. And in that, he is our vine and our friend if we obey his commandments. We can do nothing without him. So he tells us to remain in him and to bear good fruit. So John 15, I'm gonna read from verses one to five here to start. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away and every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. Already you are clean because of the word that I've spoken to you. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Whoever abides in me and I in him, he it is that bears much fruit, for apart from me, you can do nothing. In our culture, unless you, unless you make grape juice or wine, my grandpa used to make wine in his basement, so unless you do that, talking about vines and vine dressers is like foreign to us. If we want grapes, what do we do? We go to the grocery store. If we want grape juice, what do we do? We go to the grocery store and it comes in a nice package and it's clean and we buy it and we drink it. But those in Jesus' day understood the process quite well. It's not just going to the grocery store. And not only did they get it, but it represented more than just some grapes, this vine and vine dresser stuff. The vine was a symbol of life, of abundance. Those with fruitful, full vines were considered highly favored, blessed people. But for us, when we see vines, what do we do? We tear them down, because they're making our new fence look ugly. We don't see them as a prosperous thing. So Jesus comes along and he says, he is the true vine and his father is the vine dresser. And with those words, he's communicating this truth. He is the source of all life and all blessing. He's not just a vine, he's the true vine. And that means that all life, all blessings, all that is good and lovely flows out of him. And his father is the vine dresser, which means he looks after the vine, he prunes it, he ensures it bears much fruit. And in the Old Testament, we see that the vine referred to Israel, but the Israel vine was always becoming corrupt. It, it was never bearing good fruit for its vine dresser. So Jesus comes and he identifies himself. He says, look, you guys are always corrupt. Your, your grapes are always disgusting. I'm the, tr I'm the true vine, the, the vine that actually bears good fruit. In Jeremiah 2.21, God says this to Israel, yet I planted you a choice vine, holy of pure seed. 
How then have you turned degenerate and become a wild vine? The people of Israel had forsaken their God and the good vine that God had planted had become degenerate, it had become corrupt. And so God was coming and prophesying judgment through the prophet against Israel for her corruption. If they would not bear good fruit, then God had to prune it of its rotten branches and throw it into the fire. So if God did that to Israel, how much more is he gonna do that with his church? When we are in the vine of Christ, know that God will cut, he will prune. He wants you to bear good fruit, and so he's gonna take out his prune shears, I think they're called that, and he's gonna cut the vine. He's gonna cut it of all the, the sin and all the corruption that's in us. And he does it for our own good, why? So that we will bear more fruit. What's God want for you? Does he want you to have prosperity and health and wealth? He wants you to bear fruit. And he does it with pruning shears. God loves you too much to leave you the way you are. And a lot of times we hear phrases like this in church. God wants you to come as you are, which is true. Come as you are. But understand this, you will not remain as you are. You come as you are, but you will not remain as you are. He won't allow that. When God grafts you into the vine of Christ, he will begin pruning and cutting off those things which don't bear fruit for him. And that's uncomfortable. It is. I'm not going to lie. It's very uncomfortable. You are his vine now, and he will take care to fulfill his will in his vine. And his will is this, that you would bear much fruit for him. Jesus says he is the vine, and we are the branches. Now, I'm not an agriculturist, okay? I've tried to grow flowers, and it's failed every time. But I think I know this much. The vine doesn't need the branches. The branches need the vine. I used to have this pesky rose bush at my old house and every year I'd cut it and cut it and it kept coming back. I'm like, why is this happening? Because the root's still there. I had to take the ax to the root if I wanted it to die. If the branches are chopped off, the vine's gonna continue to thrive. It's gonna produce more branches in time. And this is why Jesus says, apart from me, you can do nothing. Apart from Jesus, you are literally a stick on the ground. You're rootless. A rootless tree is useless. Oh sure, ap apart from Christ, you can do things right? You can do some things, but everything you do outside of him is quite literally a stick on the ground. Garbage. But when it comes to anything of substance, anything of spiritual significance, outside of him, you can do nothing. He says it. You can do nothing, which means you're useless outside of Jesus. I know maybe you came for an encouraging word, but <laughs> this is what I got to say. Out yeah, it, I guess it is. Outside of him, you're useless. In him, you're very useful. So just get in him, so stop trying to be outside him. Therefore he tells us, abide in me and you will bear much fruit. You, there's no other way. Like if you're in him, you will bear fruit. In the same way that if a vine is, is deep and, and planted by the river and, and watered, it's gonna bear fruit. You can't stop the fruit from being born. It's the same way when you're in Christ. And the fruit you will bear is love and joy and peace and patience and faithfulness and truth, all the fruit of God's spirits. So please know that Jesus means this quite literally. Outside of him, we can do nothing. So therefore, remain in him and bear much fruit. Verses six to 11 say this. Jesus is still speaking. If anyone does not abide in me, he's thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered thrown into the fire and burned. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and your joy may be full. Now, if anyone does not abide in him, he says, he's thrown away like a branch that withers. But it doesn't end there. The branches are gathered and thrown into the fire and burned up. This is the world. All those people who reject Jesus, who will not surrender to him, notice how they are described as branches that are thrown away and wither. They're just sticks, fodder for the fire. They don't bear fruit. They're good for nothing but to be burned up. What use has firewood but for the fire? <laughs> it's its only use. 
but it's not so for the believer in Jesus. The believer abides in Christ and has a real personal relationship with their creator, and we know this because Jesus says in verse seven, if you abide in me and my word abides in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This implies what? A relationship. Ask me and I will do. A living relationship which does one thing, glorifies God. Now, some of you don't look too excited about that. I know it's early. We installed 500 square feet of flooring and my legs are about to fall off. But we can still get excited about this. I don't know about you, but bearing much fruit for the glory of God as Jesus' disciple gets me amped up. I might not look amped up, but I am. (laughs) Just believe me there, I'm trying. My spirit is amped up about that. Nothing is more exciting than walking with Jesus and bearing that fruit for the glory of God. You know why? Because you know it's God doing it in you because I can't do that in my flesh. I can't. Like, I'm a screw up. I dropped out of high school, you know, and I'm not that smart. But when God bears fruit in you, that's exciting because you know he's doing it. And this is where the rubber meets the road, the glory of God. Jesus says that those who bear fruit will glorify God. And what? He says, prove to be my disciples. Did you catch that word? Prove. Prove. The irrefutable evidence that you're a disciple of Jesus is proved in this, that you bear fruit that glorifies God. That's how you prove it. People say, you can't know if you're going to heaven. Jesus disagrees with you. He says, if you bear fruit that glorifies God, you prove it. That's the evidence that is proof you're his disciple. That means that you live your life 100% to make God's glory known in your frail body. I don't even know how that's possible, but it is through Christ. So everything you do, therefore, I'm going to make this easy for you. Whenever you have a decision to make, whatever you do, everything you do is done under this umbrella of this question, okay? Here's the question. Will this bring honor and glory to God? Yes, do it. No, don't do it. Simple equation. (laughs) You no longer care about your reputation. You no longer care about the awkwardness. You delight in one thing, loving and glorifying your maker. Now look, just face it. You are weird, okay? Come to grips with that. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are the weirdo on your street. Can you just live with that? Is that okay? Come to grips with it. Just embrace it. Embrace the awkwardness of sharing Jesus with a stranger. Embrace the awkwardness of saying the name of Jesus at a a family event or whatever. Just embrace it. It's gonna be awkward, but just love it. Make awkwardness your best friend. Make, weird, make weirdness your spouse. Get married to the weirdness. And be committed for life. And therefore, prove to be his disciple by bearing that fruit in your life that will glorify him. Now, consider this mind-blowing truth. Our joy in life will only come by loving obedience to Jesus, our king. Yes, that's right. I remember when I wasn't a believer, I thought this. Wow, what a miserable life these Christians must live. Like, they can't have sex, they can't swear. Basically, they can't do anything that's fun. (laughs) That's what I thought. But the reality was, I was the miserable one. All those things I thought brought joy actually brought misery. And it wasn't until I bowed the knee to Jesus Christ that I was actually set free and that I realized, whoa, The joy of God is full in glorifying him in loving obedience. Like that's where joy actually comes from. You know, it doesn't come from money or pleasure or these things. Like for for a season you might, you know, people uh, do like shopping therapy. You know, they go shopping and it makes them feel good for a minute and they accumulate all this stuff and then they're like, they're still miserable. They're happy when they buy it and they get that high but then it comes down. True joy is only in glorifying him. And this is a revolutionary idea. But it's more than an, 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 ah, sorry, it's more than an idea for the disciple of Jesus. It's a reality. Now, I'm not saying if you obey Jesus, you'll be a bubbly, happy person, like shade or something. No, I'm not saying that's how you'll always be. 
No, joy is deeper than a temporal feeling of happiness. Joy is not euphoria. Joy is an enduring hope and peace. Joy is what keeps us going when we don't think we can go anymore. Joy is that glue that holds us together until he returns. And this joy is ours in Christ. The vine of Messiah has an everlasting supply of joy for you and for me. And this is a byproduct of the fruit that we bear. Some will say, obey him and get joy. But I don't, look, I don't think this is a two-step process. Just like grapes growing on the vine is not a two-step process. It's an organic process brought about by what? God's grace. In Christ, you will bear good fruit, and the juices in that good fruit are your joy. It's inherent in the fruit. There's no grape that doesn't have juice in it. That doesn't exist. There's no dry grape. That's a, I mean, that's a prune, right? That's a raisin. It's not a grape anymore. But I bet you if you press the raisin hard enough, you get a little juice still. It's still in there a little bit because the juice is inherent in the fruit which is inherent in the vine, which produces that fruit. So the branch never gets the glory. The vine does in the vine dresser. As branches, we get the joy of the fruit by just abiding, being loved and loving. But it gets even better. Not just do we, not just do we get to bask in the love of God. Jesus says we are, and here it is, his friends. That's right. We are the friend of God. Anybody hear that song on YouTube? Did you watch that? Jesus is a friend of mine. It's really cheesy, you should go watch it. Listen to what he says, verses 12 to 17. This is my commandment that you love one another as I have loved you. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. You are my friends if you do what I command you. No longer do I call you servants, for the servant does not know what his master is doing but I have called you friends for all that I have heard from my father I have made known to you. You did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask the father in my name, he may give it to you. These things I command you so that you will love one another. Much of my childhood is long forgotten, probably for good reason, in my subconscious mind. But there is one particular event I remember with clear vivid memory. It was my first day of kindergarten, and I was nervous, as any kid would be, and I was dropped off at this large building, actually Forest Glade Public School down the street, and I walked into the door into like a walk-in closet, and there were jackets hanging on the walls and boots on the ground, and well, probably not boots, maybe it was winter, I don't know, shoes, stuff where it was on the ground, and, 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 I'm, and I'm, I don't know, whatever. I walked into this closet, and I could hear voices of other kids in the next room, which the classroom was there, and I was scared, and I didn't know if anybody would, you know, be my friend. I was alone. I was scared. So the teacher brought me into the room where all the children were, and I froze. I mean, what am I supposed to do? I don't know these people. It looked like all the kids already knew what to do, but I was just like an intruder or something, and when suddenly a boy named Kevin approached me, and he said, hey, you want to be my friend? And I was like, well, at this point, I'll, I'll be anybody's friend. It just did this because I didn't know anybody. So I said, sure, I'll be your friend. This kid could have been a weirdo or something. But So we became friends, and all throughout grade school, we were friends, and, and, and we're all familiar with friendships. We, we, know, we have friends. We've, you know, we know what friendship is when we see it. Some have positive memories, some negative, but the concept of friendship is not foreign to us, which is what makes this passage that much more mind-blowing. Jesus, the king of the universe, is our eternal Kevin. <laughs> He's my eternal Kevin. Look, I didn't approach Kevin. Kevin approached me, right? He chose me to be his friend. I just said yes. Jesus comes and says, look, you didn't choose me. I chose you. Why? To bear fruit, to love one another. So stop for a second and consider this. Jesus chose you to be his friend. So if you don't have any friends, just know the king of the universe has chosen you to be his friend, so you're, you're good. If sinners don't want to be your friend, who cares? His friend. Now, there's no special Greek word here, okay? 
that's translated friend. This word means what it's, it's, it's just friend. It's what it means, friends of God. And as his friend, we obey his commandments, and his ultimate commandment is to love one another. And isn't it amazing that without him, we can do nothing, that this Jesus, who's the source, the spring of life, who doesn't need us, who we need for everything, comes to us and says, hey, you are my friends. You are my friends. And not just friends, but like heaven, he chose us to be his friend. He initiated this thing, not us. He looked through the classroom of the world and he said, I wanna be your friend, I wanna be your friend, I wanna be your friend. And just like Abraham, who God says in Isaiah 48, he says, but you, Israel, my servant Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. That's Isaiah 41, God says, Abraham was my friend. And if you read through Genesis, especially the life of Abraham, you will see God appears to him in the form of a man who's called the angel of Yahweh in almost every chapter. Almost every chapter of Abraham's life, God literally just shows up as a man and says, hey Abraham, X, Y, and Z, whatever, it's gonna happen. This was not just any angel though, this was God in the form of a man. This was, this was the son of God, this was Jesus pre-incarnation coming to Abraham. He chose Abraham. Why do you think he said before Abraham was, I am? And Abraham rejoiced to see my day. He saw it and was glad. He saw it. He saw him many times. He chose Abraham and he talked with him face to face as a man talks to his friend. Remember that conversation they had looking over Sodom? Hey, you know, Lord, what if there's 30 righteous? Okay, I'll spare it. What if there's 25 righteous? Yeah, I'll spare it. Like a friend. Just having a conversation. Abraham reasoned with him. He reasoned with God. Amazing, his friend. And we are Abraham's children by faith. Therefore, we are also his friend. Granted, we obey his commandments and our friend Jesus will equip us to bear fruit. The vine has befriended the branch and he commands us to love one another and to bear good fruits. So this passage kind of gives us two opposing truths, if you will. Jesus is the vine, without him we can do nothing. And two, Jesus is our friend who commands us to love one another and he lays down his life for us. And in dying, the vine gives life to the branches and befriends the branches. And in summary, the source of life, who we could do nothing without, has chosen us to be his friends and to bear good fruit in self-sacrificial love like he has. <coughs> Excuse me. Jesus reveals himself to us in this manner so we don't become unbalanced. He's our friend, but he's divine. He's still superior, but he's still your friend. But he's still superior, okay? But he's your friend. <laughs> For those of us who love him, who keep his commandments, we can rest in the comfort of knowing Jesus is a friend of mine that he is close, that he cares, and that if we abide in him, we are truly his disciples. And what a blessed hope and peace we have in our friend Jesus. Remain in him, love one another, and so prove to be his disciple and his friend. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word, your grace to us. Thank you for being our friend Uh, We love you, we honor you, and we thank you in Jesus' name.